<laughs> that's okay so um in the next uh, 20 to 25 minutes i'm just going to go over some um of the developments in developing novel therapeutics for for various genetic eye diseases um and i've i've pitched this for quite a mixed kind of clinical academic audience so so uh yeah feel free to ask any questions if if things are going over your head as well um, so the spectrum of genetic eye diseases is vast. Um, I usually divide it into those that occur during development, so the ocular maldevelopment stage, and that can include the structural globe anomalies, microphthalmia, anophthalmia, ocular coloboma, congenital and childhood cataracts, primary congenital glaucoma, anterior segment dysgenesis, aniridia, infantile nystagmus, and albinism. And then uh, those conditions that develop from childhood um, and as adults, and that's usually where the eye is, is relatively normal in architecture, uh, but a genetic mutation then goes on to um, cause a specific um, tissue to degenerate. So that includes corneal dystrophies, inherited retinal diseases, vitreoretinopathies and optic neuropathies. So altogether, the burden of genetic eye disease is significant. It contributes to 60% of blindness amongst infants worldwide and inherited retinal disorders are the leading cause of blindness amongst our working age adults in the UK and the second most common cause um, of uh, sight registration in children. We know that there are over 500 genes that are known to cause genetic eye diseases, which can affect all parts of the eye, whether that be isolated presentations, complex, so for example, retinal dystrophy with cataracts or anterior segment dysgenesis with um, a coloboma um, and syndromic. So up to, uh, in some diseases, up to 90% of patients can have syndromic features. And these conditions are lifelong and largely incurable. So, for the clinicians in the audience, uh, it's important to undertake genetic testing for these patients. Patients and families want to know the cause. We as, as clinicians and researchers, we want to know if there are any other disease associations because it builds up our genotype phenotype correlations. But importantly, from a care aspect, we want to make sure we get the right multidisciplinary team involved. So for example, if there is a patient with bilateral anophthalmia and we find that they have a SOX2 mutation, then we know that they're at higher risk of developing hearing loss, epilepsy, and so we can get the right clinicians on board so we can minimize those comorbidities early. Um, it's important for patients so we can give them informed genetic counseling, we can advise them on their inheritance risk, how did they inherit it, how are they going to pass that on, and then introduce family planning options. So, for example, now on the NHS, we have a pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which means that um, if we find a genetic mutation in a patient and they want to start a family and they have a risk of passing that on to future children, uh, we can refer them for this. It's a form of IVF where um, you essentially fertilize the sperm and eggs. Um, and when they're just a ball of cells, you take a cell, check it for whether they're carrying the mutation and only implant the healthy embryos back into the mother's womb. By knowing the genetic uh, diagnosis, we can go on to develop treatments uh, by identifying therapeutic targets and dissecting disease mechanisms. Um, and for a lot of patients, we can now give them access into clinical trials. Um, and there is now one approved gene therapy on the NHS, and that's called Voretagene Napavavec. Um, this was a gene therapy initially um, approved in the US, but um, uh, NICE in the NHS gave it approval in December 2019. It is a, a retinal gene therapy target to, targeted towards patients who have two mutations in the RP65 gene. And in the US, the cost of this treatment is $850,000 for a single treatment to both eyes. And that's been negotiated to an undisclosed cost, but we think it's around £300,000 um, in the UK. 
So just a brief history of how we have now got to our first approved gene therapy on the NHS. Well, if we go back to 1869, uh, Dr. Theodor Lieber, who was a German ophthalmologist, first described Lieber's congenital amaurosis. Then fast forward 100 years, the human um, adeno-associated virus was discovered. Two years later, Dr. George Wald um, from Harvard was given the Nobel Prize in Medicine for discovering the role of vitamin A in the visual cycle. Um, and it was actually from this work um, that a lot of ophthalmologists thereafter started to advise patients with um, retinal dystrophies to take vitamin A supplements because they felt it was linked to the visual cycle and it would help to improve their vision or at least protect it from degeneration. But then in a subset of patients, they actually started to lose vision. And we now know because of molecular diagnosis that those are patients with ABCA4 mutations that actually suffer from a toxic buildup of vitamin A that can cause damage. I um, mean, that causes uh, a phenotype called Stargardt's disease. And so um, if any of you think that it's good to um, advise vitamin A supplements, please um, avoid that from, from now onwards. Um, in 1984, uh, uh, two doctors, Dr. Dr. Nicola Muziska and Paul Hermanat, introduced foreign DNA into the adeno-associated uh, virus um, and transfected mouse and uh, human cell cultures. And then in 1997, uh, RP65 was identified as the gene that was known to cause one of the forms of human Leber's congenital amaurosis. And the following year, um, we discovered a, a dog model called the Briard dog that had a similar mutation and that was used uh, in a lot of the preclinical gene therapy studies. Then in 2001, um, researchers from the University of Pennsylvania and Florida restored the vision in the Briard dog who was suffering from these biallelic mutations in RP65 with the AAV uh, gene therapy. And they started the first human clinical trials. Um, and in 2008, those trials, the phase one, two were published and both a group at UCL and Philadelphia published their results from their individual AAV vector subtypes but it was the US group that showed um, efficacy. And so they continued on to uh, phase three clinical trials, whereas the UCL researchers had to go back to the drawing board and redesign their, their AAV vectors. And then in 2017, the results of the phase three clinical trial were published um, in the Lancet, and they showed that um, there was an improvement in navigational vision in these patients after they'd been treated with this gene therapy. And it was all based on um, the primary endpoint using a multi-luminance mobility test. And here you can see um, it's the same patient. This patient is untreated and she's kind of struggling to get around the maze, whereas here she is one year out of treatment and she's already completed the maze with, with no problems at all. Um, and you can see she's kind of going to still struggle around for, for a good minute or so um, and has to be reorientated. So it was it's pretty convincing. So real world experience. Well, I had a, um, an 18 month old boy called Leo referred to my clinic and his mother um, had noticed that um, he wasn't making eye contact with their face, not tracking objects. And this was um, from around four months of age. He started to walk at the age of um, 12 to 13 months, but started to find it difficult to see in dim light, let alone in dark light. Um, and he also couldn't discriminate between yellow and red toys. And he had this preference for staring at bright lights. So he would always stare at his bright mobile phone, or as you can see in this video, he, he kind of just likes to go from um, the bright spots of sunlight and gets a little bit disorientated in the shadows. There was no family history and no history of any consanguinity and the ERGs um, showed that there was severe generalized retinal dysfunction. So these are his images. When you looked at the back of the eye, there wasn't much to, to actually note. It looked okay, pretty, pretty unremarkable. 
we did an autofluorescence imaging and we couldn't detect any autofluorescence. And that's actually very characteristic of patients with RP65 mutations. And then um, on OCT, we found uh, there was some retinal thinning and disruption of the ellipsoid zone. And his visual acuity was um, 0.9 logmar in both eyes. So um, he was found, he had genetic testing. He was found to have uh, mutations in the RP65 gene, which segregated nicely with his parents. And see, so he was put forward for gene therapy. So what does this entail? Well, um, it's, as I, I've mentioned, an adeno-associated viral vector, which packages, it packages up that RP65 gene. Um, the patient has to have pre, peri and post-operative steroids because these viral vectors can have up to a 20% chance of um, causing an immune reaction when they are injected into the eyes. The surgery itself uh, involves a vitrectomy. Um, the macula is detached and you have the injection of the subretinal um, gene therapy vectors injected under the retina and you can use intraoperative guided OCT during the procedure. And this is just um, a video of that procedure. This is courtesy of Mr. Robert Henderson at Great Ormond Street. And you can see the cannula is under the retina and he's, he's pushing this bleb and you can see that. So under this bleb is all the gene therapy particles. So um, this patient actually showed an improvement in his vision. Um, so after two months, his vision had gone from 0.9 to 0.5 logmar. Um, he could see much better in dim light and his current vision has been maintained at 0.4 logmar. And I'm just going to play this video because it really nicely shows how he can now see better in dim light, but also discriminate colors. Where's the blue fish? The big. Blue fish. Can you give Daddy the blue fish? Yeah. That's not blue, is it? What colour is that? That's yeah, a pink. That's pink. It's, it's... That's the blue one. Can no, I have that's the... not blue. That's green. Oh, it's green. Can I have the green one then? Yeah. Thank you. Daddy. You it is green, to be fair. Can I have a cup as well? Yeah. Thank you. I'll drink my fish. Thank you very much. A nice cup of fish in the morning to make you feel better. So, I mean, Leo would never have been able to, to have that level of discrimination, um, let alone in, in bright light, but in dim light. So from, from what we can see, um, there is certainly um, a stabilization, if not a slight improvement, especially in the younger patients that are, are having this therapy. But so generating a gene therapy for all six, 260 plus genes that are known to cause inherited retinal dystrophies is going to be incredibly costly and impractical. Um, some of the phase two, three clinical trials um, have failed. So choroideremia, unfortunately, um, is um, the current victim to this. Um, Again, the Philadelphia group were, were trying the uh, a phase two clinical trial a couple of years back with their vector that has been approved for RP65 uh, gene therapy. And after one year of treatment, they showed no difference between the treated and untreated eye. Um, and so pulled out from doing any further uh, clinical trials for choroideremia. However, Rob McLaren's group in Oxford um, their AAV vector, which had, um, the only difference was they had a, a, a wood chuck, I think, um, a sort of component um, in, in the vector system. Um, but unfortunately, they went to phase three trials and they've just reported that they have not met any of the primary or secondary endpoints. And so that, that's a big issue, the loss of efficacy. Um, safety, as I mentioned, up to 20% of um, uh, patients can suffer an immune reaction. Um, and certainly these uh, gene therapies are only licensed for a single use because we don't know if we were to develop uh, a deliver a second dose, whether the eye would be uh, primed and then they would begin, uh, build an even greater immune response. And so we need to think of other alternatives. 
Um, and just to mention that some genes are not big enough for these standard AAV vectors. So at the moment, these, these viruses can only hold genes that are less than uh, 4,500 bases inside in size. And so again, we need to think about alternative uh, delivery systems. And I'm going to talk about some of those um, as we go through. So um, one of the conditions uh, that I work on is Usher syndrome. It's the most common cause of deaf blindness worldwide. It has the prevalence of one in 30,000. Uh, children are born with bilateral congenital sensory neural deafness that can be anywhere between um, moderate, severe to profound. And then um, in late childhood, they go on to develop retinitis pigmentosa. Um, and with uh, type two ushers, uh, they don't tend to have any vestibular dysfunction, but with type one and type three, uh, they can have balance problems. Now, USH2A is um, the commonest cause of type 2 ushers, accounting for 85% of cases and is the most common cause of, of usher syndrome. But USH2A also can cause non-syndromic retinitis pigmentosa. Um, now, this condition is unamenable to uh, viral gene therapy systems, and that's because the cDNA transcript is basically five times the capacity of what an AAV vector can hold. Um, this gene sits on chromosome one and it encodes a 600 kilodalton protein uh, called usherin. So what can we do in this situation? Well, uh, we are now developing what we call non-viral gene therapy vectors. And these are essentially using DNA plas plasmids which have unlimited cloning capacity. There are no toxic viral components, so you have a reduced immune response related to them. Um, but we have this kind of um, special uh, component called a scaffold matrix attachment region, which um, essentially is found within our normal DNA. Um, it's an AT rich motif that helps our chromatin bind in the correct structure. Now, if we place this within the um, uh, plasmid, it confers episomal maintenance, which means it allows these plasmids to sit within the nucleus, but not integrate into the genome. And so therefore it reduces the risk of insertional mutagenesis. It prevents epigenetic silencing. So it prevents the cell's machinery from switching it off and silencing it. And it also promotes mitotic stability. So that means that when the cells go on to divide, uh, this will divide with the chromosomes, extra chromosomally, but can be passed on to daughter cells. So we've had some early results with these vectors. Initially, we injected um, mice with subretinal injections of these vectors, and we saw expression up to one year, which was comparable to viral vectors. And we've also um, injected uh, these components into a zebrafish model of um, USH2A where it's been knocked out at a single cell stage. And we've seen expression of um, human USH2A in these fish up to 14 days. And actually what's really interesting is we've grown up these fish till three months of age when they're adults, bred the fish, and we have found um, the uh, DNA plasmid and SMAR sequences in the progeny of those adult fish. We've also transfected um, human fibroblasts from patients with USH2A mutations and showed again a restoration of human usherin. And so our next steps is now transfecting these vectors into um, IPS induced human uh, retinal organoids to see if we can get uh, functional rescue in the photoreceptors. So, so far, this technology is um, showing some benefit. And in the future, um, it may be a safer and more effective alter alternative. The only limitation that we really need to think about overcoming with this is the fact that um, we don't have the penetration into cells as we do with viral vectors. Viruses are naturally used because they infect cells, whereas we have to think of slight alternatives um, with these um, SMAR DNA vectors. So how can we treat more patients? 
Well, I've talked about the kind of personal medicine approach to a degree. So we target a single gene, and we provide a gene replacement therapy. There are lots of trials looking at uh, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, but again, this only works towards a particular mutation. Um, and so that kind of limits your patient group. There are RNA therapies in development. So antisense oligonucleotide therapies and uh, a company called ProQR at the forefront of this, having got to phase two clinical trials for SEP290 Libus congenital amaurosis and also um, mutations in exon 13 of USH2A. Um, and mutations in exon 13 are particularly common, accounting for up to 30% of type two Usher patients. And then for dominant diseases, RNA interference therapy is also underway, but these again are targeted towards specific mutations in specific genes. A lot more work is, is going on at looking at common disease pathways. So for example, if we study um, uh, the eye in certain conditions, we know that cells die in a certain way. So for example, in patients with retinitis pigmentosa, we know that there are high levels of oxidative stress in the retina. And so um, there are now trials looking at giving patients high dose antioxidants as a potential treatment to uh, neutralize those um, charged oxygen molecules and hopefully protect the cells for longer. And then there are also uh, neuroprotectant agents which are looking to slow cell death or reduce, for example, endoplasmic reticulum stress in the cells. Again, trying to maintain a healthy environment for longer. There are gene therapies underway and, and one specific one um, is, is looking at delivering something called rod derived cone viability back to patients. So um, if we look at this retina, uh, we've got the nerve, we've got the macula and we've got the periphery. And we know that in the periphery, we have a, a large proportion of rods and the rods release rod derived cone viability factor so that um, the cones at the macula can uptake glucose and produce energy and work better. In RP, when the rods die, you have reduced rod derived cone viability factor. And essentially it's thought that the cones may starve to death. And so uh, there are groups that are about to enter phase one, two clinical trials for delivering um, this RDCVF back to the retina to see if it will help the cones preserve for longer. And then there are trials for stem cells, not directly injecting the stem cell itself, but pushing it down a human retinal progenitor route. And then I've also talked about alternatives. So if conventional methods fail, should we be looking at non-viral gene therapy and combination therapies? So um, one of the uh, other areas that I've worked on before is something called nonsense suppression therapy. Now, up to 70% of um, genetic mutations are caused by nonsense mutations. And this is where a single nucleotide um, changes. And instead of it coding for an amino acid, it codes for a, a stop codon. And it's a premature stop codon because it's not in its correct place. Um, and these um, mutations occur widely and cause many conditions and in the field of genetic eye disease accounts for approximately 30% of every disease condition. So 30% of choroideremia, up to 50% of Leber's congenital amaurosis and 40% of aniridia. And so if you develop a treatment that's targeted towards these premature stop codons, this treatment could work in a disease and gene independent manner and actually have much greater application. So um, the, the basis of this actually um, arose from understanding how um, bacterial antibiotics work. So there's a group of antibiotics called aminoglycosides. And um, essentially the way they work is that they bind to um, the prokaryotic ribosome and they cause a conformational change at something called the A site, which is the site which recognizes codons. And so when um, the protein making machinery is reading RNA, it, it can't really detect which codon 
is present. And so it just puts in any old amino acid and you end up with a jumbled selection of amino acids and a protein that is non-functional and doesn't make any sense. And it's that buildup of this jumbled proteins that essentially kill the bacteria. Now, these um, antibiotics can also bind to our eukaryotic ribosome, but much less efficiently. And so um, it's thought that when they are in the presence of a premature termination codon, um, the ribosome pauses and thinks for a second because it's not expecting to stop at that point because in the 3D configuration, it hasn't got its poly A binding protein and all the kind of repressors and activators that, that signal the stop. And so it stops and it samples what should be put in place. Instead of a release factor in the presence of these drugs, sometimes uh, an amino acid with at least two bases similarity um, can compete and insert. And when that happens, you end up continuing translation and, and producing a full length functional protein. And this diagram just shows that. So uh, with a normal, um, normal copy of the mRNA, the ribosome reads it and you get normal full length functioning protein. In the presence of a premature stop codon, a release factor will bind and it will release that um, protein and you get a truncated non-functional protein. But in the presence of these drugs, you essentially override the stop and in 20% of translation, you can get a normal protein forming. These are the different uh, combinations of amino acids that can be uh, replaced based on the two out of three codon similarity. And so, you, as I said, you can get up to 20% of restoration of um, the amino acid that you're looking for. In some cases, you won't get any change, but in some you'll introduce a missense mutation. And so it's really important you know if there's a genotype phenotype correlation, because if there is, um, and it, you get a worse soft phenotype, then you don't want to to, to try this treatment. But in most genetic diseases, missense mutations lead to a milder phenotype. So I mentioned choroideremia earlier. This has got a prevalence of one in 50,000 to 100,000. It's an X-linked chororetinal dystrophy where you get night blindness followed by constriction of your visual field and then loss of central vision in middle age. And it's caused by mutations in the, the choroideremia gene and 30% are known to be nonsense and there's no genotype phenotype correlation. So we tested this um, with a drug called atelurin, which is a next generation drug um, that works on the basis of those amino um, glycosides, but is not toxic and much more safer. And there's been quite a lot of evidence that this drug um, is very effective at reading through these premature termination codons. It's safe and tolerable. It's licensed for children less than two, and it's taken orally. It's powdered, dissolved in water three times a day with minimal side effects. And it's licensed on our NHS for the use uh, in treating patients with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So we tested this on our zebrafish model, um, and this is a healthy zebrafish eye at day um, six post-fertilization. You can see the lens, the nice layering of the retina and the optic nerve. This is a choroideremia zebrafish eye, which has cataracts, severe retinal de degeneration, loss of lamination, areas of RP hypertrophy, and this was the, the, the fish treated with atelurin. And then um, we, tr we actually tried a lot of other drugs. These are called amino, uh, designer aminoglycosides. So they've had the toxic parts chopped off. Um, and um, this is um, uh, atelurin here. And you can see we, we saw significant increase in protein following these drug treatments. Um, we also tested it on um, IPS-derived RP from patients with choroideremia. So this is RP with the choroideremia mutation. And again, following drug treatment, we see um, an increase in, in the function of the REP1 protein that has been produced uh, following dosage uh, with atelurin. And so just to summarize, there's been a lot of preclinical evidence on various different condi genetic conditions um, that involve the eye that show these, this drug work. So we've got RP, 
um, Usher syndrome, Bardet Biodol, Alstrom syndrome, Aniridia, and Croideremia I mentioned. Um, and there was a clinical trial for atelurin um, for PAC6 nonsense mediated aniridia. Um, but unfortunately, um, the clinical trial failed to meet its primary endpoint. And the primary endpoint was a change from baseline in maximum reading speed with both eyes open at week 48. Um, secondary outcomes were best corrected visual acuity, reading speed in each eye, corneal keratopathy, and iris area. Now, the reason I've put this here is because we undertook a natural history study of patients with PAC6 aniridia. And you can see from this graph that the visual acuity doesn't change really that much over a lifetime. And so if you're looking at trying to pick an outcome measure to detect a change, um, you, need to you need to be picking one that basically shows a change within the lifetime of your trial. So if your trial's only 48 weeks, visual acuity is not going to change. So considerations for trial design are hugely important. If you don't pick the correct endpoint, you may not get a positive result. Interestingly, with the choroideremia trial that failed the gene therapy, the primary endpoint was best corrected visual acuity. And again, that doesn't change for at least four or five decades of life. So, you know, we really need to think about this carefully. We need to think about the mode of delivery. You know, if we're treating the cornea in aniridia, because we know the fovea isn't going to change much, um, then we're looking at potentially an avascular structure. So is oral administration the right way? Would topical be a better way to deliver? Um, and then what about molecular prognostic indicators? So there is something called nonsense mediated decay uh, that, it, that naturally occurs within all our cells. And this is a mechanism that basically degrades RNA transcripts in our cells that hold um, premature termination codons because they don't want a buildup of these RNAs that may lead to the transcription of uh, a translation of, of, of truncated proteins. And so you can measure those levels uh, in tissue and blood. And if you've got very low levels of baseline RNA, then maybe you know these kind of drug treatments might not be as effective. So again, we're kind of going back to personalized medicine and thinking about more specific biomarkers. So to conclude, gene therapy for genetic eye disease is a reality now. We need to make sure we send our patients for genetic testing to get that molecular diagnosis. Um, that will unlock their access um, and will aid um, development of treatments for researchers like myself. Um, and there are lots and lots of clinical trials in the pipeline. Um, just to direct you all to this uh, website, which is gene.vision. Um, this has been launched uh, by my group uh, last year, but there are entries for patients and healthcare professional scientists. Um, the patients' ones are written in lay accessible language. Um, the other ones are, are slightly more technical, but are a reflection of each other. But it gives you really nice information about the condition, the management we should be offering patients, the latest research links to clinical trials, um, and um, support organizations um, for those uh, looking for help. So with that, I'd just like to thank my collaborators, my team, and my funding bodies. And again, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Thank you so much, Maria. That's a fantastic talk. Really um, stimulating and encouraging in, in equal parts. Uh, so um, we've got some questions in the chat already. Um, one of them from uh, Aya Byrne. Do you think um, liposomes could be potential delivery alternatives for these large genes? I do, I do. And I, and I think it's, um, we need to do a lot more work thinking about how we package the DNA into these delivery mechanisms. So liposomes are definitely a, a, a good way forward. There are various other um, nanoparticles that are under development um, and I think we need to look one at the way we want to administrate. So is it same old subretinal? Is it uh, intravitreal uh, with, with 
various targets that can be targeted towards particular glycans on, for example, photoreceptors. If it's um, anterior segment disorder, should we be looking at what can penetrate the retina? Um, um, sorry, the cornea. So yeah, absolutely. I, I do agree that liposomes have, have a future with this. Um, and yeah, I guess my ne next question you've kind of already alluded to. What, it, it seems like it would be quite a, a significant challenge to get these gene therapies through the surface of the eye after topical application. Have you got any pointers there or um, how, how possible do you think that is? So, I, I mean, I think the, I think we need to go as close to the target tissue as we can. So we know that we're, we struggle with drugs penetrating the back of the eye through topical ways. Um, I don't think we necessarily have to try to do that. I mean, if somebody did develop something, that would be completely amazing. Um, but I think we do need to think about topical for anterior segment and then either intravitreal slow release devices um, for um, back of the eye. Saying that though, um, a lot of the work that we're doing now is where we're taking a, a closer look at patients with inherited retinal diseases. Um, and for example, in choroideremia, we've been doing metabolomics on uh, plasma samples from patients. And we're actually seeing quite a lot of systemic disturbances. Now, if the blood retinal barrier was broken and there were indications that there are systemic uh, disruption, then maybe oral treatments could be of benefit in the long run too. So I think there's still a lot of development and I don't think there's a one size fits all for, for, for any of these things. Maria, an obvious question that Mark goes through my head is obviously $850,000 is a significant amount of money for one injection. Um, so does that mean it's not going to be accessible to most people with RPE? No, I think that was because it was the first ever one. And I think, you know, they literally have pumped so much money into this industry. I mean, I can't think how much. So um, that that is so Spark Therapeutics licensed Luxturner. Novartis bought it for everywhere outside of the US. Uh, Biogen own Nightstar, which were taken over or are part of Johnson and Johnson. And then you've got Mira, or no, Mira might be Biogen, and Johnson and Johnson are uh, Nightstar. But either way, I mean, they're, they're pumping tons of money into this and it's not sustainable for it to be that expensive. Um, so as soon as we start to get a few gene therapies come through and our PGR is, is looking promising, um, there's a, a chromatopsia trials again, that's a difficult one because I'm not sure, you know, what the primary endpoints are really going to show there, but um, I think as more come to the forefront, the price will have to go down. And ideally, I'd love to, to have a, a situation where you've got a cassette, you slot in the gene and you yeah. just can prescribe it to someone in the future. But, you know, at the moment, we're still hung up on this testing one gene at a time, uh, which is fine. But again, things like the rod derived cone viability factor will make a huge difference. So... Um, Zubair, and, and, and I guess to all the other um, ESRs on the call, I think it's worth reflecting that while these are expensive treatments, the lifetime cost of somebody being blind to the economy is really high. Um, and so if you look in, say, cancer therapy, we, we've uh, I've got patients now who are being treated with £300,000 a shot cancer therapies. Um, that While, while £850,000, I agree, is probably not really sustainable. Um, you, you, you may well be surprised um, just quite what level is sustainable to avoid some a lifetime of blindness from a young person. Uh, yeah, I, 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 th I think we're probably um, probably into lunchtime now. So thank you so much, Maria, and thank you all other other speakers. Thank um, you, Maria. But we'll, 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 we'll close the discussions now and we'll reconvene at two o'clock. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, Take care. Take care. Bye. And you. Thank you, Maria.